Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, the uh, last phase of uh, the afternoon of the day, which really uh, is three panel discussions that I hope will be lively, controversial, and stimulating. Um, we're the, the first one is going to be on a surgical aortic valve replacement, and I'd ask uh, uh, Dr. Rule, uh, my partner, uh, to, to lead uh, the, uh, the panel discussion. Ross, would you mind uh, inviting the other panelists up? Well, thank you very much, Mahesh, and, and thank you all for being here, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of this meeting for such a, a, an incredible uh, what I call Disney World for Surgeons. Um, this is just a, a, a great uh, teaching and learning opportunity. And I uh, would like to uh, introduce my uh, fellow, the fellow panelists uh, right now. If you can please come up if you're in the room. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mattia Glauber and Simon Moten, Tom Wynn, and Basil Ram Ramlawi. And I'd like to, uh, this is a free form uh, discussion here. I'd like to make this more of a discussion than anything. I'm, I'm not necessarily going to present anything here. I'd like to uh, open this forum up uh, for discussion of interesting issues surrounding aortic valve replacement. And we're gonna have more, more discussion later about specifically about TAVR versus SAVR. Um, but I'd like to uh, introduce the discussion of surgical aortic valve replacement and uh, interesting topics. Now, this field has changed dramatically over the last few years. And uh, just a few years ago, I remember talking to patients and I, I thought it was really cool that we had this long conversation about uh, what valve types do you want a tissue valve or a mechanical valve, and we talk about age and whether you want to get pregnant or not and whether... Uh, you know, how long do you expect to live and, and Coumadin versus no Coumadin, the risk of structural valve deterioration. All these discussions were, uh, were, were absolutely critical to choosing what type of valve we're gonna put in this patient, uh, but it was always through a sternotomy and it was always uh, on pump and, and, uh, and with the same type of uh, initial procedure for a straightforward isolated AVR. Nowadays, we, uh, we've changed the age uh, the age, age uh, discussion because we have newer data on newer valves that are better. Um, the, the risk categorization is much different. And now we have uh, not just the question of whether or not we go, uh, uh, whether or not we look at TAVR versus SAVR, but uh, is it a high risk TAVR? Is it, is it a medium risk TAVR? Is it a low risk TAVR? Are you on a clinical trial? Uh, is, the, um, is it a bicuspid valve or not? Uh, does it look like it's bicuspid on the echo, but it's not bicuspid by the CAT scan? And we have all these different factors that play a role. Um, so I'd, I'd like this to be a discussion. I'd like to really welcome the audience to, uh, to bring up questions and talk about these, these issues. And, uh, and I'd like to open uh, the discussion up to the panelists. I do wanna bring up, since, uh, um, since Mahesh had talked about doing a case presentation, I wanna bring up one case that does sort of Across some of the some of these discussion points, um, and this happened last week. Uh, there was a 26-year-old girl who had given birth uh, a couple of months before. Um, she was breastfeeding a four-month-old when she went into congestive heart failure, and went into very profound congestive heart failure, requiring uh, intubation. Uh, and at age 26, she had had I'm sorry, at age 25, she had had a uh, tissue valve placed uh, six years prior when she was 19 years old for a bicuspid aortic valve. At that time, she had never had kids, wanted to have kids, and uh, really wanted to spend the next couple of years uh, with her husband uh, planning a family and, and um, getting the family going, and then she was gonna have a couple of kids and then uh, talk about when it was time to replace the valve. And after uh, about a two hour long discussion in the office, uh, I took her to the operating room, did a mini sternotomy, and did a, uh, uh, put in a 25 millimeter um, um, tissue valve. And so six years later, now four months after delivering her first child and her last child, she says, um, she was in profound CHF in our, in our ICU uh, with a failing uh, tissue valve. So it took about six years for this 25 millimeter uh, valve, which had a normal gradients when it was implanted, 
uh, to fail in this 19-year-old girl, which is not unpredictable. Um, so she, we decided that because of her florid pulmonary edema, she was not a great pump candidate. We didn't want to put in another, <coughs> we didn't want to put in a, a, a TAVR valve and put in another tissue valve at that time. She wanted a mechanical valve and she was done having kids. So we uh, were planning to clinically optimize her, uh, talked about putting in a mechanical valve the following week when she got better and she started getting better. She got extubated, she was walking around the floor and on Saturday night when I was out of town, uh, two in the morning, she went into florid pulmonary edema, got worse and worse. And uh, by Sunday morning, she had her new TAVR valve and, uh, and she got discharged in three days. Uh, and last night she called me and uh, was doing great uh, about a day after discharge. So uh, it's an interesting situation. It's something that's out there. Um, I remember when she came in and they called me and said, this 26-year-old had a tissue valve. I said, what idiot put a tissue valve in her? Uh, only to realize it was me. Um, so I'd like to uh, open, open the floor up to the panelists first if, uh, if you guys would like to comment on this case or another case. And then I'd like this to be free form. Uh, anybody with a discussion or a, or a um, topic from the audience, please uh, come to the microphones or raise your hand. I, th I think that's an interesting scenario, and I, I followed your line of thought, and I guess the way you're painting the picture, is it was a little bit of a failure that they ended up putting a tower valve, but in some ways it really wasn't, right? Because either way, you know, maybe five, six years down the line, you're going to have to re-enter the chest, and you have to re-enter the chest either way, right? So it's still her, it, it's still, you know, her second time into the chest, and you've bought her five, six years without having to go into her chest, and she's still relatively young. She, should, she, should, she still should do fine, so I don't think in some ways it's necessarily a failure. I think the key thing is that we know in valve and valve, oftentimes there is residual patient prosthesis mismatch, so we've got to make sure that whatever tavern valve you put in there, you have a, a reasonable gradient, because we know that there's a mortality effect if you don't put um, a valve that has uh, adequate uh, hemodynamics. And, and we did not look at this as a failure at all. We looked at this as a change of plan. And uh, when my partner told me, Dr. Reardon told me that he had done this on, on Sunday, early Sunday morning, I said, thank you for saving her life. You did the greatest thing possible. And, and this 26-year-old with a four-month-old baby um, is doing great now. So uh, absolutely. But now we, we have the discussion of uh, intervening earlier than before, when the valve fails. So we're, we're talking about what the timing is for, for the next intervention. Um, and she will get her second uh, redo sternotomy at some point in the near future. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that patients like that will always have a surgical option at some point in their career, in their, in their lifespan. You know, we get a lot of these patients, not the pregnant type, but the endocarditis type, which is a similar type of a discussion that you have with these patients. And oftentimes, you know, you don't want to put a mechanical valve in, in them for the same so social issues. Um, but uh, it all depends, I think, a big factor of what we choose to do, knowing the valve and valve option is a real one, is what size valve can you get into that patient at the first operation. So that, I think, is a key determining factor in terms of what valve goes in at the first procedure. And that, that's critically important, and I think this discussion now has, uh, has changed the way that we look at things because uh, we, you know, about probably eight years ago, um, I remember doing about 20% of my AVRs were aortic root enlargements. Uh, when the trifecta valve came along, that changed, and, uh, and I almost never did an aortic root enlargement. And nowadays, trying to avoid an externally wrapped uh, uh, valve and trying to avoid a 19 or 21 millimeter valve, uh, I think root enlargements are the way to go in a lot of patients. And there was a, a patient not too long ago, about a, uh, a couple months ago, uh, we were doing a TAVR valve and valve, and we were uh, looking at try, working the patient up uh, and looked to see what size valve the patient had. And he was about probably 380 pounds. And uh, about 13 years ago, David Ott had placed a 27-millimeter uh, tissue valve in this in this gentleman when he was uh, when he was uh, in his late 60s. And uh, now I was very thankful that he did an aortic root enlargement to put the biggest valve he could possibly put in this patient 13 years ago because now we could get a, a TAVR valve in him without a patient prosthesis mismatch in this now 80-something-year-old, 390-pound gentleman with a, who is going to go undergo a redo valve. So the foresight, uh, he wasn't doing it in order to get the best uh, TAVR valve in, uh, but nowadays that we know that TAVR is an option, uh, 
uh, for valve and valve. I think it changes the way we look at which valve we choose, uh, what size valve we're gonna put in, are we going to accept slipping in a 19 trifecta uh, in a 65-year-old patient uh, who may need another valve down the road? And so I think that's a very important uh, discussion point. So Ross, what valve do you choose? Today? For me? <laughs> Yesterday. Today. So uh, my current tissue valve is, uh, right now I'm, I'm really uh, liking the gradients that I see with the Medtronic Avalis valve. Um, that's a relatively newer valve. I don't know what the durability is going to be uh, long term. This, the clinical trial um, data was, was good and the, um, the gradients that I saw on the patients that I followed for three years were all single digit gradients, um, even with smaller valves. So I, I like the gradients. I think the gradient uh, across the valve has a lot to do with later structural valve deterioration. And, uh, and so that's been a valve that I've been using. I also use, um, I also use uh, Medtronic Mosaic and uh, Edwards uh, as well. So, but the, uh, more and more recently, I've been using a lot of the Avalis valves and I'd like to hear others' comments on their experience with it. Yes. So I'd like to, oh, it's working. I'd like to pose a question to the panel, I think following up on Tom's uh, comment as to uh, if you're planning uh, on a tissue valve for a young patient, we have a lot of Percival uh, experts on the panel. What is your youngest patient that you would put a Percival in? And should that number go lower because when you put a second uh, valve in, a valve in valve, you don't deal with the, um, with the, uh, the sewing ring. And so is it true or do people think that if you start with a Percival, you can get a larger TAVR valve in in the future? Is that, is that uh, something that we could take for granted uh, or uh, does it not apply? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I uh, have my cutoff uh, of uh, age, uh, let's say around 65. Below, I uh, usually choose a, sh a sutured valve. And uh, uh, surely Percival allows you to implant uh, a, a bigger uh, tower. But I don't have experience related to this, even if I have implanted hundreds of Percival. And uh, actually, I did not have to reoperate any patient for uh, early degeneration. And uh, uh, I start to implant Percival in 2011. So, and even I was present to the first implant in 2007 in Hanover. And uh, I know that this patient is still alive. He is now 93 or 94 years old. Uh, surely we have in literature some uh, early degeneration, but the problem of early degeneration is more related, in my opinion, to a oversizing and uh, not uh, uh, really degeneration, but leaflet thrombosis. So it's mostly a single or double leaflet thrombosis due to a non-radially totally expanded uh, valve. Uh, I heard and I read about some uh, valve in valve with Percival, uh, but the problem was totally different also related to oversizes, uh, oversizing, and it was an infolding of, uh, of the valve. I know that also here in US there were some cases uh, and uh, all related to the aspect of uh, uh, a wrong sizing. I, th I think your points about the uh, leaflet thrombosis are very relevant. I think so the uh, epicardial wrap valves, um, the externally mounted valves, and some of the other valves that we've tried to cram in to the uh, to the annulus, and this this notion of trying to put the biggest valve in possible, set them up for later TAVI, um, and avoid root enlargements, has created a problem where where we are cramming valves into an annulus, and that is potentially setting up this uh, this issue of restricted leaflet motion, uh, which is causing thrombosis and. I think that some of those early early failures we saw, I mean, I was a, I was a user of the Mitra flow and we all thought it was great gradients, but we were, we were putting in probably too big of valves in some of these patients and the valves were failing because they were thrombosing. You know, you'd see gradients of uh, in the 30s or 40s, six months, 12 months after putting it in and that can't be, 
just calcification of the valve. It's got to be something else. So this is a real problem. Um, but I think that the Percival is, a, is an excellent valve to put a TAVI in. I have never put a TAVI in a valve, but it, it makes sense. It's, a, it's an ex expandable valve. It's easily seen on fluoroscopy, and it has the potential that the uh, sinusoidal struts will protect the coronary arteries. Um, should you put a tissue valve in, in a young patient? I mean, I always ask myself, what, what sort of valve would I have? I'm, I'm you know, getting into that age where uh, you know, it, it, it could potentially be a realistic phenomena. Um, is valve and valve uh, are going to be a realistic option for everybody? It, it's certainly not going to be a realistic option for everybody. And you know, I like to ask myself a lot of questions. What, what's my, what's my uh, coronary arteries look like? Am I likely to need a cabbage when I'm 70? And am I likely to get it diabetes? What's my family history? And there's a lot of factors. But we, we've all had the experience of redo surgery. If you, if you put a, a valve in a 50-year-old, doing a redo when they're 60 or 65, as long as you set it up properly, it's really not a hard deal. A, a, a redo valve cabbages, they've had previous cabbages a little bit different, but it's certainly a redo valve um, is a really, I think for most of us, is a pretty simple operation. Um, and I, I don't think we should dismiss that thought. So I think once you've done a, a valve when they're 50, you bring them back when they're in their 60s, early 60s, and then if they, they're 75 and they need, a, need another valve, I think a, a valve and valve is an excellent operation. So that's sort of more where I like to think that I take my patients down that path. Yeah. Can we get a comment on the on the right here? Uh, actually, I wanted to ask a question about a follow-up on the first case you had, and to see what this panel's uh, experience was with the next phase of operations that we're going to see in our career, and that is the surgical explantation of chronic TAVR valves for either you know, surgical replacement or not. Has anybody, have they been around long enough? Has anybody had the opportunity to do that um, in the chronic situation? Can you tell us what you found? I've done it in three, I've explained three TAVR valves. They've all been in the first year for whatever technical issues face the TAVR valve had, but not in a degenerated prosthetic TAVR valve that has come back. We just I've, haven't seen a lot of degenerated TAVR valves. Yeah, so, similarly, I've, I've explained uh, in three, three to four years or so. A, a couple of notable things. Uh, um, once a valve's implanted, it's actually pretty hard to get out. You know, I, I guess I remember in the past when we did the TAVRs, we were thinking about the valve embolizing. It's not going anywhere, especially with the calcium there. It's anchored pretty hard. Um, if you have a balloon expandable valve, the, the approach is to really kind of scissor the valve and kind of crush the valve and, and, and pull it out. Um, but it's hard to get out. The other thing I, I, I want to bring up is, <clears throat> in the past, surgeons would always say a disadvantage of TAVR is that you don't resect the calcified leaflets, and, um, and that's why surgery is better. And in the, saver, in the TAVR valves that explanted, uh, and this is severe AS beforehand, you know, by all criteria, and I took the TAVR valve out, and the previously, presumably, very calcified leaflets were mush. It wasn't even calcified at all. So I think the argument that doing a TAVR, uh, doing a SAVR is better because you're resecting leaflets, I'm not sure if that really holds any weight. I don't think that really matters. In my, ex my experience of resecting a TAVR valve uh, and looking at the native leaflets that were, again, presumably calcified, and down the line, I think maybe some remodeling happens and the leaflets aren't calcified at all. To, an to answer your question um, also about the TAVR valves, if they are nitinol based, like Percival, like core valve, for example, a lot of, uh, it would be a lot simpler just to put some cold water on it. It shrivels up the valve because it is, you know, it, it tends to be a lot, uh, very thermoreactive, obviously. And to answer, you know, your question, that's one of the benefits of using a nitinol-based valve. I think it, it does have certain intrinsic benefits for a valve and valve property because it is going to be more expandable and potentially have better gradients in, in, a, in a future procedure. Not to mention Correct. So I'd like to make a, a couple of comments. First is related to the issue related to valve and valve. Um, my feeling is that if you're thinking about that in the future, then Percival is the superior bioprosthetic valve to use um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you have used Vinnie Bappert's valve in valve app, you will see from it um, this app that was developed by his 18-year-old daughter uh, during her summer break, 
uh, which has been so useful to all of us, you will see that the smallest Percival valve, uh, which is a small size, which fits from 19 to 21 annulus diameter, will comfortably accommodate uh, a 23 S3 valve. And that is not the case for the smaller sizes of the stented valves. Uh, the other point about the Percival valve is that um, unlike the Inspirus valve, which can be fractured, uh, when you do fracture it, it opens in one area. There's an expansion of the radius, I mean of the diameter of the perimeter, excuse me, in one area. Whereas with the Percival valve, there's the theoretical advantage that when you do expand it, it's, a, uh, it's an even expansion around the entire perimeter of the, of the uh, nitinol frame. Now, in terms of explantation of valves, I had the opportunity to explant a core valve last week that was put in by Basil in 2015 as a valve in valve in a patient who at the time had a degenerated degenerate prosthesis that had been placed several years earlier. He was in his early 80s at the time, and um, he did well after the procedure, um, uh, and I believe it was a 26. He came back because of endocarditis. Um, and so I explanted it last week, took out the, the, the core valve and his uh, previously placed bioprosthetic valve. Um, he's doing fine clinically, amazingly, he's 86 years old. But one observation that I made on the explanted core valve, which was three years old, was that all three leaflets had a great deal of calcification on them. And you could see there were really two patterns of calcification. One was at the corners, but most pronounced was on the belly of each leaflet, there was this sheet-like speckled calcification. The leaflets were opening, but I imagine if you had some sort of way to assess the compliance, you would begin to see that there was some sort of restriction in leaflet motions. I know this has been looked at with 40 CT, et cetera, but it was an interesting observation, and I don't know, Tom, if you and Basil have seen that in, in your explanted cases. Finally, well, in case I don't get the chance again, I'd like you to, uh, after we've had this discussion, to consider having a discussion about issues that are related to perfusion and cannulation in minimally invasive aortic valve uh, replacement. Uh, things like, what do I do if my venous drainage is bad? And all this kind of stuff. So thanks again. Um, I just had a quick question in regards to uh, like aortic root enlargements and just what your preferred techniques and approaches for that. And then secondly, um, have you guys ever considered uh, in like a 70 to 75 year old patient with uh, you know like a large BMI short, small aortic root um, and annulus, would you just instead of doing aortic root enlargement, just put in a, a mechanical valve? Ever have opted to do that and uh, instead of doing an aortic root enlargement? I think the the first answer to your question is uh, Percival is is the answer to a root replacement a uh, root enlargement. My apologies, I haven't felt the need to do one of those for the last five years, um, and thankfully that's the situation. I mean, the last one I did was a was a young lady who was about fifty, um, and I haven't put uh, Percivals in in that younger age group. And and certainly your point about mechanical valves, you you shouldn't ever. Um, forget that the low gradients that you'll get with a low profile uh, mechanical valve certainly is an option if you don't want to do a root enlargement but I think that the the role of root enlargements these days is certainly becoming less and less I don't know what the other panel think yeah I, I completely agree um, I think now we have much better surgical valves with better gradients and better EOAs like you know the sutureless valves especially Percival with this self-expanding frame I think the valve and valve concept is a, is a good one, but again, to answer, you know, to address Mahesh's comment uh, with regards to the, a lot of it has to do, and I'm probably not surprised, I'm not sure what size of that previous valve, the surgical valve the patient had that needed to come back in three years, but a lot of those patients are left with a very high gradient um, in the valve and valve scenario. So a lot of it does depend on the initial valve that you have. And there's a, you know, there seems to be some preliminary data that shows a supraannular TAVR valve is better than an intraannular valve um, in those valve and valve procedures if they have especially a small annulus. So if you cannot get a good uh, size valve at the, begin, at the beginning, then the patient is likely going to come back for another procedure because gradients are going to be a big problem.
I, th I think an aortic root enlargement is an excellent procedure for every surgeon, every cardiac surgeon who does valve surgery needs to know how to do an aortic root enlargement at the minimum of a manugian uh, aortic root enlargement, putting a patch in the back of the, of the root is something that every surgeon needs to know how to do because there are times when you are going to face that and you're not ready for it. And so you always want to be ready for that. Um, I think you should, it should be part of every surgeon's training and it should be a part of every surgeon's armamentarium. Uh, that being said, I haven't done one in a long time now because I haven't really needed to, but I think uh, there, are, uh, there are situations where it's very helpful it's an excellent uh, operation. It's very, it's it adds very little to the to the morbidity of the patient if you do it right, and so it's something that you need to look into and, and kind of know how to do. Uh, but that's that's my comment on that. In agreement with everything that's been said about typically not needing them as much as we used to, but I think that it's a good it's a good uh, tool to have in your in your toolbox. That's a, a right comment. Uh, I totally agree with you. Everybody of us should know how to enlarge, uh, and uh, it's even something that it can be done through a minimal invasive or right, right. thoracotomy approach. I also had the experience uh, that in older patients, I never had to enlarge anymore uh, when I use uh, uh, Percival, because uh, in any case, uh, if you are not able to enlarge the LVOT, it does not make sense to enlarge just the root if right. you don't uh, really need because your supra annular portion is too small. So if we don't need to enlarge the LVOT, we can put the Percival, which in any case uh, will sit uh, uh, at the end of the native LVOT. So uh, I think. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, is uh, rational and uh, Percival can solve all these kind of problems. Related to the valve involved, I'm sure that we are creating a new pathology for surgeons because uh, uh, there is a very high excitement in uh, uh, implanting valve involves without taking care, uh, which is the size uh, uh, so my cardiologists are even not asking us uh, what we think about, and they don't know uh, the history of all the prosthesis. And they, yes, they rely to the, uh, uh, to the app if they uh, know that the app exists. Otherwise, it's just the uh, product specialist of the company who tells, yes, you can do it or not but the product specialist does not take care about the follow-up of this valve. So this is at least what I have in my experience. So I am not so enthusiastic in proposing valve in valve in all the patient, especially if they are uh, younger. Uh, so we will see a new pathology, and I'm sure that uh, this patient, uh, as you just experienced, uh, don't have such a high risk of, uh, uh, of doing surgery, even if uh, uh, they are older. Uh, as he said before, uh, reduced surgery is uh, not something that increases the risk uh, so much uh, Yes, if there is a coronary artery disease, uh, uh, can be more tough, but uh, uh, replacing a prosthesis is not so complex. Ralph. Yeah, um, excellent discussion. I have a comment and then a question. My comment is, and it's a bit of a word of caution, we do have quite an experience now with Valve and Percival. Um, and I, I think, at least in our hands, and Madia proctored me, and I, I felt like I could do it well, but. And maybe we were slightly oversizing, but I didn't feel that way. But we've seen quite a worrisome amount of early degeneration of the Percival, which I've never seen with any valve except the mosaic, which we've stopped using also for that reason. But, um, you know, I, 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 I'm still concerned about that. And I think, you know, we can maybe say it's thrombosis, but we just have not seen that with the standard bioprosthetics. And why I love, I love the valve, and I, I agree, and older people, it, it really eliminates any need for really doing root enlargement. I'm, I've, we've at least, and I've personally stopped using it 
in anybody under the age of 70. And I've, we've seen early degeneration. I had, the last one that came back was a 75 year old. I mean, I think it's something we'll have to follow. I know that that hasn't been your experience, Madia, but certainly in our center, uh, we have become a little bit, I just would say it's, I'm not 100% sure we can say this is a savior for us. It, it seems to have a problem, whether it's with early thrombosis that you don't really see with bio, other bioprosthetics that are stented, I don't know. But um, all I can say from our experience, unfortunate experience with uh, four now valve and, valve and valves with, uh, it does allow for a very large <laughs> taver, but you'd rather not have to go that soon for it. And I think it's been a little upsetting for the patients. I think time will tell about that. I will have to say the hardest valve, I, I have uh, explanted a couple taver valves early, and I don't think that's difficult with any of the valves, but one valve that we did that I will say is the, the Edwards Intuity valve with the big subannular skirt, uh, that's, a, that's a bear to get out. Um, we've had one with endocarditis, and after getting that thing out, um, it had been in for a little over a year. And with endocarditis, we, had a, there were, we were left with uh, not only having to do a commando procedure, because it basically tore that whole area over by the left atrium, but also tore the membranous step, septum came out with the valve too. So we had a large VSD. It was challenging and not something you probably want to be doing every day <laughs> if you're, uh, but it's really hard to get out. I would use a freer dissector if you need to get it. Um, that's my, those are my comments, and, and I, I, this is from our experience at our center. But the, the question I have for you guys, with the right, we haven't really discussed the elephant in the room, is the lowest trial. I mean, will we even have a panel on SAVR in uh, five years? I just wondered, where do you think with the lowest trial, what are even the indications for surgical valve replacement? Because I know in our center, the cardiologists are pretty convinced that it's yeah, like getting um, minimal. I mean, maybe a true bicuspid in a young patient. Uh, but will we ever, I mean, someone asked a question about a 75 year old and whether you should ever do a root and I mean, I don't, will we ever even see those patients? So I'd wonder if you could speculate what percentage of valves in five years will be SAVR versus TAVR? Right. Um, and do you think we'll be, maybe we won't need to talk about biologic valves anymore because we may not put any in. The only patients we're going to see are going to be 30 year olds with bicuspid valves. I don't know. Well, we, we are going to talk think? about it a little bit more because we're going to be talking about it all day tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> we actually have a session on, on TAVR versus SAVR, and a lot of that is going to be aimed towards low-risk clinical trial. And, um, and so, uh, uh, so we, we will have that discussion. And, and, uh, but I'd like to uh, just ask the panelists briefly um, if you could describe some of your experiences with difficulties with uh, cannulation, with, uh, with flow perfusion, uh, do any of you use the endo clamp? Have you seen good or bad with that? Um, uh, just we have a few more minutes remaining, um, and, I, and I hate to change that, the subject, but I would like to ask that question um, as far as perfusion techniques, uh, cannulation issues with minimally invasive aortic valve surgery. I have, I have one one case that that could be a potential pitfall for for the group out there and kind of learn from my experience. Uh, this was you know, maybe a 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six gentleman, about 300, 350 pounds. He was a high school football coach and, you know, pretty good body habitus. His LVOT was like 2.3, 2.4, so I thought it was going to be really straightforward, slam dunk, minimally invasive case. Uh, I put uh, cannulate peripherally as I usually do, venous drainage with the 25 um, uh, biomedicus uh, venous cannula and over the right atrium, and everything was not decompressed at all. I couldn't see absolutely anything at all. I was struggling, I was scratching my head. And then what I realized was, it's, I think a really important teaching point is, um, that cannula wasn't long enough to reach the SVC. It just kind of sat in the IVC and a little bit in the right atrium. And really, even though perfusion had excellent flow and drainage, uh, they weren't decompressing the heart. Uh, and um, just something to consider in these tall patients who are, are pretty big, you're not gonna get enough drainage. I know that uh, Sam and, and Sloan, uh, with the robotics, they kind of advocate uh, upper extremity drainage as well, and, and that's what we did. So then we put a cane on the neck and, and everything decompressed, and I was able to see everything. But something to consider, uh, I'm not sure what kind of venous cannula these guys use. Um, another potential cannula is the next-gen cannula. It's a, a bicable next-gen cannula. It's a little bit longer, so some of these you know, kind of taller patients, it might be worthwhile to use that cannula as your kind of initial peripheral venous drainage of choice. If not, then consider upper extremity drainage because you're not going to uh, adequately decompress the heart. 
this one of the techniques we use with the uh, right anterior thoracotomies, um, if you'd used and employed a few times when the venous drainage has been poor, and I, I agree with your point, my experience has suggested if you get that venous cannula into the SVC, surprisingly it, it works very well. I, I've been putting in 28s in so many people to try and avoid it, but I've found that if you get a 25 in the SVC, you're fine. But what I've always done, when we run a bypass, if we struggle, and as you know, when you struggle, the right atrium's full, the right ventricle's full, and really you get a lot of backflow and it obstructs your view, is I've just simply said, well, we're going to put a chest tube in at the end of the operation, so we're putting in another port across the chest. So I just then put in just a simple straight 18 French cannula across the chest wall, sew it into the right atrial appendage, and bang, your venous drainage issue's gone, and, and you wire that back into your peripheral venous line. It takes you five minutes. It's what we do routinely you know in a minimally invasive setting and it, uh, it it solves the issue everybody's quiet the operation's easy and we move on the only other um uh cannulation issue I, I, issue i'm going to share with you is i prefer central aortic i i have a philosophical feeling that if you've got aortic valve disease you've got a diseased aorta and i think it's probably in the patient's best interest to do anti-grade flow if you can um but i learned the hard way that uh, it, it's when you got to decannulate that you don't get your assistant to tie the purse string on the right anterior thoracotomy because they're coming around the bend and the finger doesn't go there. So what happened in that case is the aorta came out of the right anterior thoracotomy and I had a hell of a hold trying to fix up. So that was, and I put used pledged sutures on the aorta just to give you that little backup um, so that you don't run into those troubles and I tie all the sutures when the cannula comes out. Yeah, um, I've had a couple of issues when we first started our right anterior thoracotomy program where perfusion, uh, well, first is that we had the opposite where we, the cannula was in too deep, where the venous cannula, it tends to be the, the venous cannulation, which is the, the you know, the, the big issue with these right anterior thoracotomy and invasive procedures. And in this case, the, the cannula was in too deep into the SVC, and that caused, you know, lack of drainage. And on top of that, what happened is that the perfusionist had the venous uh, vacuum d cranked up all the way and you can see that in a small venous cannula in a small SVC it was you know b the whole thing was just collapsed on the cannula and you didn't get good drainage and as soon as you know you elevate the table a little bit come down and you you pull the cannula back and all I do is that I just feel for it and I always advance it to a level where I, you know it's about an a centimeter or so into the SVC and that usually gives you uh, very good drainage with no concerns at all but you really want to make sure that the RV is well drained and we take as much time as needed for 10, 15, 20 minutes even if needed to make sure that the RV is completely drained. Otherwise, you won't have good protection and you'll have problems at the end of the case. So that's, that's critical. So what are you doing in that 15 to 20 minutes to change the milieu? So uh, the first thing is you confirm. I, I never put the candle in unless I have echo guidance and confirm it with uh, the wire into the SVC and then the candle under direct vision uh, with men, you know, finger confirmation into the SVC because I have that small incision there so I can feel it, plus the uh, TE guidance confirm it there. So then that's number one is positioning. So you have to cut the suture, pull it back, or pull it in, oftentimes as many times as needed. Number two is that you have to check the volume status, make sure that the holes of the cannula are in the right direction. And then, you know, oftentimes just raising the table a little bit allows for improved drainage and you don't need as much um, uh, vacuum you know, with perfusion to try to get that. So oftentimes that does a trick. Okay. Uh, just real quick, I think we have to wrap up. Uh, we've been getting the sign, but I just want to make two comments uh, also with regards to cantillation strategies and so forth. Uh, two little tricks I, I've started using and found helpful is for uh, percutaneous venous cantillation, I use a stiff wire. Um, have run into the issue of, of a buckling wire, especially in heavier patients. So I use a stiff an Amplatz wire. Um, I feel very comfortable using this wire from my other uh, Tavar experience. I think it's important to not push anything. Obviously, that won't go, especially if you use a stiff wire, but I think it's not any more dangerous, and it really helps with getting the cannula in. The other thing is uh, with, I, I like to do uh, central aortic cannulation as well, and it obviously brings up the uh, issue of decannulating and doing it in a controlled manner. Um, what I use is I replace, I have two Rommels, I, I use pleasure sutures, and then what I do, I, I can essentially almost decannulate myself without assistance because what I do is I replace one of the Rommels with a core knot. It's an extra cost, but I essentially replace the Rommel with a core knot and use that to cinch down, take out the cannula, uh, 
secure it, secure the other one. Um, Cornut has never failed me in a very short-lived career, but I think it's a great tool. Yeah. And I can't Can emphasize that, that stiff wire trick <laughs> that Maurice just mentioned. It's a very, very good thing to use. Oftentimes, especially in obese, big patients, it gives you a much safer access to, into the vein rather and than a, a wire that kinks. Just an additional thought. Um, the tendency sometimes is to go straight down on the vein. Also another good thing to do, obviously, you want to come in in a shallow angle for the venous uh, thermal accumulation. Thank you. Can I make just two short comments for a particular situation in which I was faced? Uh, one was uh, uh, the uh, persistence of the left uh, uh, superior vena cava return in the coronary sinus. It's uh, one of the situations in which I asked my anesthetist to put a jugular cannula on the left side. And then I open the right atrium and I put a foley inside and I occlude so that I can uh, have a venous return from this. Uh, another situation, and this is the second situation in which I ask my anesthetist to put the right superior jugular uh, cannula is when I have uh, a ostium primum uh, with uh, a venous return in the superior vena cava so that I can keep my cannula high and uh, I can keep the cannula in the uh, inferior vena cava. A third quite uncommon situation, but can be uh, uh, even an indication for minimal invasive, is the presence of cava filters, which are not a contraindication for uh, placing a, a cannula even through the filter. So don't worry about. And this, uh, if you uh, don't pass with a wire, you can put the two uh, cannulas, uh, one in the uh, uh, femoral vein and the other in the uh, superior uh, cava. So this is quite uncommon, but uh, uh, a situation that can appear. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for your attention, and, and I appreciate uh, the remarks from the panel. Thank you very much, everybody.